Welcome to Monitoring Clinical Trials at Wake Technical Community College. My name is Steve Pope and I'll be your instructor for this 16-week course. Uh, tonight we um, had our first in-classroom session but the remainder of the course will be taught online using the Moodle uh, teaching environment, learning environment. But then we'll conclude the course at the end with a practice monitoring visit that will be conducted in the classroom. So all of you will be um, participating in that. So what I want to do tonight is get you oriented into what monitoring clinical trials actually is and what the purpose of this course is. I think it fits into our local training infrastructure in such a way that it provides a basic hands-on uh, training in monitoring for people who are interested in getting into the monitoring role um, or for people that just want to understand more about it. Maybe you work in the CRO industry or you work in the pharma industry and you're, you just want to learn you know, what takes place during monitoring visits and what monitors do on a daily basis and this is a great way to learn uh, what that is. Um, as we go through the course, they're going to be weekly modules and they're going to go cover study startup and the activities associated with that. They're going to be um, modules on conducting uh, the monitoring visit, reviewing the regulatory binder, reviewing staff training and qualifications, source data verification, subject safety, investigational product accountability, PI oversight, remote monitoring, protocol deviations, and, and, and all the things that, that, all the components of what we do on a monitoring basis. So let's get started with what the purpose of monitoring is. And as a foundational note, all the instruction that I'm going to provide for you is going to come from specifically from ICH E6 uh, R2, which is the good clinical practice. Um, the latest from, um, from ICH and also the current thinking for FDA in terms of good clinical practice. And we'll be citing these uh, guidelines as we're going along. But let's start with the purpose of monitoring. So there are essentially several purposes. Um, they include uh, we want to verify that the rights and well-being of human subjects are being protected. Second, we want to verify that uh, the reported trial data are accurate, complete, and verifiable from source documents. And then finally, we want to verify that the conduct of the trial is in compliance with the currently approved protocol or protocol amendments with good clinical practice and with the applicable regulatory requirements, whether they come from, uh, from FDA or whether they come from uh, another regulatory authority. Uh, we want to make sure that, that sites are complying with that as they conduct the trial. So let's take a look at the uh, learning objectives that we have for our first module, Introduction to Monitoring. They include um, to discuss the purpose of monitoring. We're also going to discuss monitoring requirements from a regulatory authority. We are going to cite the different types of monitoring visits and what's involved with each one. And then finally, we're going to describe the attributes of a monitor. What do they need to bring to the table in order to be successful in this role? So I discussed the purpose of monitoring um, in slide one of this presentation. So let's talk about monitoring requirements. Now these are found in ICH E6 R2 section 5.18. So in this section of ICH GCP guidelines discusses monitoring requirements the R2 addendum, which is the latest version of the GCP um, documentation, discusses specific activities that, uh, that sponsors should take um, to a systematic, prioritized, risk-based approach to monitoring clinical trials. 
I've even copied a, a piece of the addendum right there on this slide so you can see what it looks like. So let's go over that in a little more detail and see what is exactly involved in this systematic uh, prioritized approach. So section 5.18 that we've been talking about is broken down into the following subsections. And they include purpose, they include selection and qualifications of monitors, uh, the extent and nature of monitoring, what the monitor's responsibilities are, monitoring procedures, they discuss the monitoring report, and the monitoring plan. I'm going to go over each of those in a little more detail uh, as we go along. But these are the different subsections in section 5.18. So let's talk about the purpose of monitoring. This was one of our first um, learning objectives. It involves basically three components. Subject safety, in other words, are the subjects that participate in our trial, is their safety uh, being taken care of? Or are we doing something that's creating an unsafe environment, an unsafe trial for these subjects? Second, we're looking at data quality and accuracy. Are we generating quality data from our trial? That's going to be data that is transcribed into the case report forms that we're going to collect in our clinical database. Is it accurate? Um, is it of high quality? Is it meeting the needs of what our trial protocol says that we should be collecting in order to determine if our trial is successful? And then finally, does it meet protocol and good clinical practice compliance? Are our sites complying with the protocol? Are they uh, conducting procedures that are required of the protocol? Are they doing them in the correct sequence? Are they conducting the trial according to uh, the components of the protocol, according to the schedule, the visit schedule? Um, and are they doing it in a while complying with good clinical practice uh, regulations and guidelines? So those three areas are what we are assessing when a monitor goes out to a site and monitors their performance on a periodic basis on that clinical trial. So next is the selection and qualifications of monitors. Monitors are going to be appointed by the sponsor. If a sponsor is working with a CRO, the CRO is going to present potential monitors to that sponsor, probably in the form of a, of a CV that they're going to review and determine whether or not that sponsor's experience meets their needs. They may even interview them if they have some questions uh, to assess you know, their fitness for the, uh, for the trial. Then we want to ensure that monitors are appropriately trained and that, and that they have documented qualifications. So how do we do that? Well, start with the CV. What kind of training do they have in monitoring? Um, have they been through a university course? Have they been through a private course? There are lots of private courses out there, some of which you're familiar with. Uh, many companies, many CROs in particular, have CRA training. Uh, you could get monitoring training uh, through private universities as part of either a bachelor's program or a master's program or a certificate program. There are um, specific uh, private courseware that's available through companies like Barnett or an organization like Clinical Research Fast Track that you may be familiar with. And there are lots of others around the country that you've probably heard of, probably uh, are somewhat familiar with. And these can be areas where um, monitors can gain training that's documented that can then be used to satisfy that training requirement that they need in order to, to be placed on a, on a trial. Uh, they also need to be familiar with the investigational product, the product uh, protocol requirements, the informed consent process, GCP and regulatory requirements. So once again, many CROs and pharma companies will you know, have a, uh, an array 
of training, not only in the protocol, but also in proper informed consent process, GCP, regulatory requirements, that monitors will be required to complete before they can be placed on a trial. And normally these are um, training programs that are need, gonna need to be updated, uh, maybe not on an annual basis, but certainly on an ongoing basis to refresh that training and to keep it current. So these are ways that we can assess the qualifications of a monitor that's gonna be on our clinical trial. So let's talk about the extent and nature of monitoring. So there are a couple of bullet items here that we wanna talk about. Um, sponsors will determine the extent and the nature of the monitoring um, process. Uh, for example, they're gonna determine how often um, sites need to be monitored, how many monitoring visits uh, need to be made at that site and what the duration of those visits is going to be, what the time frame in between visits uh, might be. And these are going to be determined based on a number of factors such as the design of our trial, the complexity, the size, and what the endpoints are. Those can be factors that determine how much monitoring and what type of monitoring we need to do um, at each site. Sponsors are also going to develop a risk-based approach to monitoring, meaning that there's going to be a combination of on-site monitoring where a monitor physically goes to the site, spends time there, maybe they spend a day there, a couple days there, monitoring during a visit, versus an off-site monitoring um, capability where uh, that may be done on a remote basis and then that's followed by some telephone contact that uh, may produce a, a, a monitoring report based on what, what, the, uh, what the requirements are. So a lot of companies are doing this and we'll get into that in a little more detail um, as we go along. But these are the things that we're gonna be talking about when we're talking about the extent and the nature of monitoring. Next, we're gonna talk about the monitor's responsibilities. So these bullet items come directly from ICH E6 R2 section 5.18. So monitors are responsible for conducting and documenting the following activities during their monitoring visits. Number one, they're gonna verify investigator qualifications and resources. And we're gonna have an entire module a little bit later in our course that discusses how you go about doing that. They're going to verify the handling and accountability of investigational product. That's very important because that's one of the components that can really only be done by a physical visit to the site to actually see the investigational product, see what they have on hand, physically see what's been returned by a subject to properly account for each of the doses. We're gonna verify written informed consent of subjects. Once again, this is one thing specifically with a paper informed consent, which most trials are still using. The only way to look at that is to physically go to that site because that informed consent never leaves that site. It remains there. You have to go and look at it and verify that the subject signed informed consent properly. The person conducting consent was authorized to do so. And, and everything is properly documented. We're also gonna verify the receipt by the investigator of the investigator's brochure. That's very important. We're going to verify that protocol training has been uh, provided for all of the site staff and that that's documented when it was provided, what the nature of the training was, who performed the training, that all needs to be documented so that we are assured we can, we can determine that all the site staff has been appropriately trained on how to conduct the protocol. We're also going to verify that the site is enrolling eligible subjects. Uh, we're going to report what the subject enrollment rate was, what, what was their screen versus enrolled rate? What was the number of screen fails that they had? Did they have any withdrawals uh, that are premature early terminations? We're gonna document all of that in our, in our monitoring report. 
We're also going to verify that source documents are accurate, complete, and are maintained. Uh, everything that the site performs on the trial must be documented. The rule of thumb is if it's not documented, it didn't happen. If they say they conducted um, an ECG, if they say they dosed the subject, there's got to be documentation there to, that indicates that they did so. The, and they have to date and time stamp it so that you know when and where that occurred and by whom. We're going to verify eCRFs for accuracy and completeness. This is called source data verification. We're going to verify the collection, assessment, and reporting of adverse events, or AEs, some of which may wind up being serious adverse events. We're also going to verify the maintenance of essential documents that are listed in ICH E6 Section 8. If you ever want to take a look at that list, you'll know what types of documents um, sites are required to maintain in their investigator uh, site file, or, or commonly known as their regulatory binder. We're going to discuss all that as we move through the course. And then finally, we're going to verify and report any protocol deviations. These might be deviations that uh, you know, were, were things that they omitted, things they didn't do, things they produced errors um, when they performed them. So we'll, we'll have a whole uh, module on, on protocol deviations and what that consists of and how we identify them, which ones need to be reported to the IRB, for example. Part of our monitoring requirements is to uh, develop monitoring procedures. Uh, and monitors are to ensure that they follow written procedures for monitoring the trial. Um, usually this will be in the form of a clinical monitoring plan or just a monitoring plan if you want to. And this is going to document all of the monitoring activities that you're going to perform, such as the frequency of visits, the amount of activity that's expected to be done at each visit, um, how long after the visit uh, is your report due, um, the expectations of what will be monitored at each visit, such as the number of CRFs that will be reviewed, um, will all the informed consents be reviewed, will a monitor be required to do investigational product accountability, at each visit? Are they required to review the regulatory binder at each visit? Do they go over uh, subject safety, protocol deviations, etc.? You know, all of that information will be contained in our clinical monitoring plan that we're going to use to, um, to formulate uh, all of our monitoring visits and provide us with a, a roadmap for what we're supposed to do at each visit. One of our major requirements is going to be the monitoring report. So let's take a look at that and see what's involved in producing the monitoring report. So the monitor at the conclusion of the visit is going to submit a written report of the monitoring visit to the sponsor, um, including the date the visit was done, the name of the site, the name of the monitor, and the name of the investigator. And this will be done in a timely manner. Normally, there's going to be at least a, a documented time frame on when this would, which should be submitted. It might be uh, within two weeks, or it might be within three weeks, depending on what uh, what the sponsor asks us to do. Um, it's going to include a summary of the monitoring findings, any observations uh, that were that were observed, um, any protocol deviations that occurred. And it's going to contain a list of outstanding action items. Not everything you're going to be able to complete during a visit, so you're probably going to have some follow-up items um, that are going to need to that are going to be left over from your visit that are going to be um, actioned and concluded uh, as you go along. Then you're finally going to review of the report is documented by the sponsor. So they're going to document that they reviewed the report to see if there was, uh, you know, see if there's any issues they had with it, 
um, it's important to understand that the report is not submitted to the site. So it's only submitted to the sponsor. So the site is going to receive a follow-up letter that's going to contain a summary of what is, of the report content. Uh, so that's going to be sent to the principal investigator and the others associated with the trial at that site are also going to see the letter and it's going to document and summarize the things that are in the uh, monitoring report. So our monitoring plan is going to describe the monitoring strategy, the methods used and the rationale, and also the responsibilities of all the parties. So that would include what the monitor's responsibilities are, but just as importantly, what the site's responsibilities are, because it's very important because the site needs to understand what they're required to do in order to ensure that the monitoring visit is successful and you don't waste a lot of time out there. So we want to communicate to them what our expectations are in terms of we want to have these documents available for review, we want to have these subject charts available for review, we want to have your pharmacy procedures available, your IP accountability, we need to assess all of those items when we come, so it's important that, that we be able to do that. Coordinators need to be available to answer questions, to um, fix issues that come up, to respond to queries that we might um, place in the, in the EDC system, things like that. We also, our monitoring plan is also going to emphasize what critical data and processes need to, need to occur. And then it's going to give attention to the aspects that are not routine clinical practice, which is very important because it, uh, it's important for sites to, to understand that um, routine medical practice and research are two different things. And so there are going to be processes and procedures that are associated to research that are not associated with, um, with, with medical practice. So it's important that we uh, kind of illustrate the differences and they understand the differences between the two. And then finally, it's going to be a reference for applicable policies and procedures. So if we have certain uh, standard operating procedures that we, uh, that we want to use for things like um, reviewing informed consent forms or documenting protocol deviations, things like that, we want to document that in our monitoring plan, you know, which policy we're going to adhere to as we monitor the trial. So now let's talk about the different types of monitoring visits. And some of these you're going to be familiar with, some of them you may not be familiar with. So they're going to include your pre-study site visit or your PSSV. Um, the next visit will be the site initiation visit. Then you're going to have your interim monitoring visit, uh, which is going to be the, the visit that we conduct most frequently. And then we may have, if we're using a, a risk-based strategy involving um, off-site or remote monitoring, we may have off-site interim monitoring visits. And then finally, we're going to have a closeout visit. So these are the different types of visits. And so let's take a look at each one and where you can see the similarities and the differences. So the pre-study site visit, or PSSV, is normally conducted during the startup phase of our clinical trial. And the, the purpose of this visit is to assess whether or not the site is suitable and capable to perform our trial. So in this visit, we have a number of principal components. So we're going to discuss the study procedures because we're talking specifically about a protocol with the site. We're going to take a look at the site staff and its facilities. Um, are the site staff trained? Do they have the appropriate experience? Um, are the facilities adequate to conduct the study? Um, are they participating in competing trials? You know, that could be a major factor, major risk factor in whether or not we choose that site to conduct our trial. Subject recruitment. You know, do they have access to a suitable number of, of subjects where they can 
uh, where they can enroll, uh, meet the enrollment requirements that we're looking for on our trial. Um, and then finally, we're looking at the site and sponsor specific recommendations and requirements. So at the end of the, the visit, does the CRA recommend that the site be used? Um, does the site meet the sponsor specific requirements, you know, such as experience using specific equipment or conducting specific procedures? Do they have the, the type of uh, facility needed? Can they conduct, say, overnight stays, things like that? Uh, you know, those are some of the things we, we need to assess during this visit to determine if this site is, is going to meet our needs. The next type of visit is going to be the site initiation visit. So this is just as we, just as it sounds, we're initiating the, the site to conduct the trial. So we're going to go over all of the study procedures, um, what the you know, adverse event reporting requirements are, what the informed consent requirements are, what kind of laboratory requirements do we have for our study. We're going to go all, over all of that. Um, we're going to uh, begin to assess uh, the training and qualifications. We're going to collect all that, all begin to collect all those essential documents um, that we've been we talk, talking about. Uh, so we're going to collect documentation of that. Hopefully a lot of that has already been done by that point, but if it hasn't, we're going to collect that during the site initiation visit. Uh, we're going to once again take a look at the facilities. Are, there, are they adequate? Is there monitoring space available? Uh, do they have additional facilities that we need to take a look at? Have they received all of their investigational product or, and study supplies? Sometimes they will have those, sometimes they won't. If they don't have it, then that's probably something we're going to have to do at the very first uh, interim monitoring visit. If they do have all of those, we want to go through all that, make sure they have what they're supposed to have. If they're missing anything, we document that. Um, we're going to begin to reconcile the essential documents that we've collected up to this point um, and make sure we've got everything uh, that we're supposed to have. And then finally, we're going to talk about recruitment and enrollment. How many subjects do they have ready to screen? How many of those screening subjects do they think they'll be able to enroll? What do they imagine their screen fail rate to be? Uh, those things. We're going to talk about all that stuff during the site initiation visit. And then at the conclusion of that visit, then we're going to be able to activate the site and give them permission, give them a green light to start screening and enrolling subjects. The next type of visit that we're going to do is going to be our interim monitoring visit or our IMV. And we're going to conduct a series of those over the course of the trial, depending on what the length of it is. We might do three or four. We might do 11 or 12, um, depending on what the length of the trial is. So a couple of the things that we're going to be doing, we're going to be focused on doing source data verification and source data review. We're going to make sure that what they've entered into our clinical database matches what they have collected in paper form or in their electronic medical record if they're using that. And we're going to make sure those data points match. We're also going to do something called source data review, which is a little bit different. We're going to review all of the data that's available for that subject. Not all that data is going to be entered into our database because we're going to have medical records, we're going to have lab documents. We may have, you know, uh, emergency room or emergency department uh, medical records that we need to review, and all of that stuff isn't going to go in our database. But we need to review all of that because that is a hidden source of things like adverse events, um, concomitant medications that may have been missed by the sites. So we need to review all of that, even though we're not necessarily verifying, matching up those data points in our clinical database. We're going to do um, investigational product or IP accountability. So we're going to review all of their accountability logs, their drug shipment records, the IWRS receipts that they've done. We're going to make sure that they have an inventory what they're supposed to have an inventory. 
um, as subjects bring back their unused IP, we want to account for that and make sure that what they're accounting for matches what's in what they have in their inventory of return drug. And then finally, we're going to uh, either ship back the, what, what's unused or the site may destroy it, depending on what the protocol calls for. Um, and we're going to need to see evidence that they destroyed it properly. We're going to do serious adverse event review. You know, hopefully they won't have any serious adverse events, but if they do, we need to review all of those. Uh, we're going to have, normally we'll have some hospital records that need to be reviewed, other medical records that need to be reviewed, lab reports, ECGs, maybe MRIs, things like that. Other pieces of medical data that need to be reviewed, and we need to make sure they have all of that, and to make sure that they've reported everything within the time frames that they're supposed to do that. And then uh, finally, we want to do essential document reconciliation. These essential documents are going to change over the course of our trial. We'll have new staff members that join the trial. So we've got to collect all the documents for them. And we've got to match, match up what we have in our electronic trial master file with what the sites have in their investigator uh, investigator site file, make sure they match and make sure they're current, make sure our medical licenses are current, they haven't expired, make sure the CVs are within two years, that they've been signed and dated within the past two years to indicate their current version of the CV, things like that. So there's a lot of different things that we need to do during our monitoring visit, but these are kind of the, the main categories of things that we're going to do and we're going to get into this in a little more detail as we go along. If we're working on a trial where remote visits are done, then these are probably going to be done by some type of central monitoring associate or remote monitoring associate, depending on how, how the, the, the company names that particular role. But they're going to be reviewing things like centralized vendor data which is going to be things like laboratory data, ECGs, um, any kind of electronic uh, patient reported outcome like a dosing diary or an, an adverse event diary or a ConMed diary. You know, many trials are using these now and these are components similar to your smartphone where a, a subject keys in their, their dosing time each day that they dosed on the IP. So these are things that can be reviewed on a, on a remote basis, so your, your central monitoring person can, be, can review those. Um, these visits a lot of times are conducted over the phone. They might last half an hour or an hour where they're talking with someone there from the site and going through a, a series of, of questions with them. They're also going to review some, some data findings. The site has already been in, uh, entering data into the EDC system and that can now be reviewed um, to see if there are discrepancies that, that might have existed. Are they entering data correctly? Are they following the, the, the CRF completion guidelines? Things like that. Um, we're also going to assess the site status and performance. Things like are they screening and enrolling in adequate numbers to meet the expectations? Things like that. Um, and then finally, this, this you know, central monitoring associate is going to write up a, a, a trip report of some kind and submit that to the sponsor that's going to document um, the, uh, the trip discussion and what their findings were. And then the last visit we want to talk about is the closeout visit. So closeout visits are going to be done at the end of the trial. All the data has been collected in our database. We've closed our database. Um, we now have it ready for the statisticians to do their final statistical analysis on. So now we're going to go and we're going to visit that site and we're going to close them out. So some of the things that we're going to do, we're going to do our final essential document reconciliation and collection. Hopefully that, by that point, there won't be very many documents that, that need to be collected, but there will be some that are collected during the closeout visits, such as things like temperature logs for where IP is stored, 
um, the closeout report that they're going to send to the IRB that's going to close them out. <clears throat> the, uh, the final uh, delegation log is going to be collected. The site visit log will be collected. And then the, if they haven't been collected already, the IP accountability logs will be collected um, at that point. We're going to have some topics to discuss with the PI, things like on, uh, ongoing review of adverse events, financial disclosure obligations, records retention, um, relocation or change of PI status, things like that. We'll have a list of items to discuss with the PI during that visit. And then, you know, finally, we'll do any serious adverse event reconciliation that may need to be done. Sometimes uh, it may need to be done at the closeout visit if there's any outstanding issues. So we'll accomplish all of those things at the closeout visit. So now let's talk about the attributes of a monitor. Let's start by taking a look at some of the hard skills that you need to have in order to be an effective monitor. First of all, you've got to have you know, medical training and knowledge. Uh, you, you, you need to be able to understand medical records, medical terminology, read lab reports, uh, read other you know, types of, of medical data and have some experience in that. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be an, an RN or a physician's assistant or, or anything like that but you at least need to have some basic knowledge of the medical sciences in order to, to truly be effective. Then you've got to have knowledge of clinical trials and training and experience. You know, do you understand how trials are conducted? Do you understand what the study startup uh, stage is like and what study close out and, and, and the things that occur beyond that? Uh, so having that knowledge is very important. You also have to be able to uh, communicate effectively in writing um, because you do a lot of your communicating uh, that way. So you've got to effectively be able to write reports and uh, specifically emails and instructions and things like that. You've also got to have some logic skills. And by that I mean do things make sense. When you re start reviewing data um, and you start comparing what's on one eCRF page versus another eCRF page, does everything seem to be in order? Are there any gaps in what you're seeing? Uh, so those logic skills come into play with that. And then finally, you need to have good computer skills. You need to be very proficient in some basic computer systems like, for example, Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, things like that. But you also need to have knowledge of you know, CTMS, clinical trial management systems and what they, what they do. Um, EDC systems, what they do, IWRS systems, things like that. Uh, you're going to be using a lot of different systems as a monitor, uh, a lot of vendor systems, and so understanding how reports are written and how data is extracted from these systems, the more you understand about that, you know, the more effective you are in the monitoring role. Now, in addition to those hard skills, you also need to have a variety of soft skills that you're proficient at. You know, for example, managing your time effectively and working efficiently. A lot of the work that you're going to do is by yourself. So you've got to be able to you know, plan your time and, and, and work your plan and be able to work effectively and efficiently alone because you're not going to have a lot of other team members um, around you. Most of the time when you're on site, you know, you're going to be working alone. You're not going to be there with another another monitor in many cases. Um, you've got to be able to stay on schedule. So that includes the work that you need to do before the visit, what you're doing while you're on site, and then the, what you do after the visit is over, and then preparing for the next visit. So staying on schedule is very important. It's very important not to get behind on certain tasks. Um, you also need to be able to work on a team. You know, you've got internal team members at your company. You've got external team members. <clears throat> if you're working for a CRO, you've got sponsor um, representatives that you're going to be in contact with. So you've got to work effectively with them. Um, you've got to be able to use good interpersonal relationship skills. You're working with sites and you're in this role 
kind of as a site manager, so you, you want to get them to do things, but you don't have direct control over them. So you've got to use some persuasion skills and you've got to you know, really uh, work with them in a way that they want to help you. And then finally, you've got to use some good judgment. You know, learn when to escalate problems and when to kind of deal with them yourself. So your readings for this week are listed here. So out of the um, series guide to monitoring clinical research, fourth edition, <clears throat> you're going to read chapter one. What is the CRA? And then I've posted some other documents for you on Moodle. Uh, one is the the uh, uh, a, a, a document about a clinical trial from the Britannica Online Encyclopedia. It's not very long, but I think it'll it'll be very effective for those of you that kind of need a, a short refresher review on that. And then finally, I've posted um, ICHE6. Um, R2 for you to take a look at, specifically the section that we've been talking about, section 5.18, um, which is the monitoring section. You'll find that on pages uh, 33 and 37. So that's what your reading assignment is for, for this week. So for your online assignments uh, for this week, um, <clears throat> I've posted a couple of discussion forums on Moodle for you. First, I'd like for you to take a moment to introduce yourself to the class. Um, you know, basically answer these questions. Describe your experience level in clinical research um, up to this point, and then discuss what you hope to get out of the class. And then, you know, how did you learn about the class? Uh, any other information you want to tell about yourself, uh, you are certainly fine. If you want to mention, you know, if you have a family, you might want to mention that. Um, but whatever you want to put in there, just kind of take a moment to introduce yourself to your other uh, class members. And then finally, you've got two discussion forum questions that I'd like for you to go over uh, this week. The first one, which I think is going to be kind of a fun little exercise, I want you to find a job advertisement for a clinical trial monitor um, and then post the content of the ad in the discussion form. You don't have to post the entire ad, but you know, maybe post sort of a couple of the components of it. And then I want you to review the requirements of the job and then answer the following question. You know, after reviewing my own skill set, your skill set, you know, what are the two or three requirements that you need to improve on or acquire in order to meet the requirements of the job? And I want you to be honest with yourself. On that, if you need more training, indicate you need more training. Um, if you just need more experience in the clinical trial arena, you know, discuss that. Uh, but whatever you think the the area that you might be might be lacking in, you know, go ahead and mention that, and, and and you know mention if you have a strategy for hopefully improving that. And then for your second assignment, what I want you to do is answer the following question. You know, based on the discussion of the different types of monitoring visits that we went over this week, choose one of the visit types and answer the following question. What are the two principal challenges to conducting a successful visit for this visit type? Now, there's no right or wrong answer there. I'm eager to understand you know, what, what you think is important and what you've gathered from this week's reading assignment and this week's lecture assignment and seeing how you respond to that question. So good luck to you. Let me know if you have questions and I'll see you all out there on the discussion forum.